Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech, weekly Q&A tech session. You've got any questions, use that hashtag, Ask GMBN Tech. Get them in the comments underneath. They could be about anything. They could be about me, they could be about bikes, they could be about spanners, drills, whatever. Anything goes, as long as it's loosely to do with mountain bikes and mountain bike tech, retro tech goes, muddy tech, you name it. We, we're here, we gotcha. Right, so first question this week comes from uh, Jessica, Jess Cranby. Can you use a hookless rim for a tubeless conversion or do you need hooked rims? Yeah, you can use whatever you want. So pretty much in case anyone's not aware, there's two major types of rim you get, hooked and hookless. Traditional rims have a hooked profile, which means you've got the rim bed and the actual sidewalls of the rims hook over at the top. The purpose of this was the beading on the tires then can use the old sailor's grip and hook into place, which you would think is absolutely essential for tubeless tires, but um, it's really not. You can actually set them up pretty much any way. Now, hookless rims came around, I, I forget the time, probably mid 2000s or something like that. Of course, I think they've been around previously, but in mountain biking and when rim technology started moving on, I had a set of IBS 741 wheels, which are well, somewhere floating around. Um, they're 41 mil wide carbon rims and they're hookless. Now the advantage of a hookless rim is you can make the sidewalls much thicker because you're not having to profile it. So the sidewalls being thicker means they're much stronger. So when you smash them on rocks and stuff, they don't dent or crumple or deviate. The slight downside to them is they're so strong that you can split a tire with one. So it's kind of horses for courses, but generally hookless rims tend to be more popular these days and they're more popular with tubeless as well because that's what most people are running on expensive high-end wheels such as those. So yes, you can, it's no problem, despite the fact that the physics don't seem to work, but um, anyone that understands physics will tell you it does, but uh, don't listen to me. They work absolutely fine, so don't worry about that, it's all good. Uh, next one's from Justin. Okay, can I use automotive brake cleaners and grease on my bikes? Okay, so yes, you can. So a brake cleaner, like this one right here, essentially it has isopropyl alcohol and acetone in it. They're like the active sort of ingredients in there. And many brake cleaners have a fairly similar formula. You might get some that are a bit more aggressive out there, but really brake cleaners are brake cleaners and they are brilliant. I use brake cleaner more than I use degreaser on anything. It's, I love this stuff. It didn't smell very good though, so make sure you use ventilation if you're if you're going to be using it indoors. So motorcycle brake cleaner, yeah, is essentially the same style product. It does the same job. So yes, of course you can. With grease though, I'd be less keen on because bicycle grease comes in a few different forms. You get suspension grease, which tends to be very thin, very uh, very thin and very slick. It's different to motorcycle-based greases. They tend to be a bit thicker. They stay in place arguably a bit better. And then of course, you're not, you don't really need that stuff on a suspension because it's a lot of it's open oil bath or you know it's, it's much heavier duty equipment on motorcycles than you have on mountain bikes. Also adding to the fact we have carbon frames which can be damaged by certain types of grease. And we have important seals and bearing seals and stuff which are made from rubber, which can be perishable with certain types of grease. So get yourself a good, hold up, get yourself a good workshop spec grease, something like this or something like this. There's loads of options on the market and they will tell you on there if it's carbon safe. So this one specifically says, developed for use on bicycles. And it does say, I'm sure it does. Yeah, carbon safe grease. And I'm pretty sure this one says the same thing on there. I can't see it, but it does. I know it does. So, but just double check, use a bicycle specific grease. And as far as suspension goes, there's loads of different offerings on, on the market. Here's one from RSP called Slick, Slick Kick. Super, super thin grease. I wouldn't bother with a motorcycle grease for that. Um, leave that to your motorcycle. Can't beat the correct thing for the job. Uh, Nick Higgins, is that a model of an Audi Quattro Group B rally car in the background? And Fozzy S asked about it as well. Yeah. Yeah, this was a, um, a late Christmas present to myself. It was on my Christmas list. Uh, Father Christmas didn't bring me it. I guess he didn't, you know, didn't listen to me, but uh, yeah, of course I had to have that. And yeah, I know I'm fully aware that I'm old enough to not play with this, but it's Lego and it's an Audi S1 Sport Quattro Group B rally car. I love these things. Probably the coolest car of all time, um, at least in my eyes. It's off-road, it goes like stink that turbo flutter and all the pops and bangs. It just looks angry when you see, you know, go on YouTube, type in that model of car and just look at some of the best of compilations. You've never seen a car just look so angry, just clawing at terrain. 
unbelievable things. I love the short wheelbase on it as well. So it's almost square. I mean, I don't know if this is exact replica it's Lego, but um, it's gonna be pretty close. Imagine how that thing handled with that amount of power. Group B was insane. I'll tell you what is cool I've been looking at recently though, is that Porsche Singer, the ACS Safari. Uh, but it's basically a prototype, isn't it? It's two versions, there's a road one, the off-road one. Oh my God, what a vehicle. Right, completely non-bike related. What is your favorite vehicle? Not a mountain bike, you're not allowed to say that. Come on, let us know in those comments, just have a bit of fun, just interested. If I could have anything, well, I'd love one of those, but let's face it, you're never gonna be able to use it anywhere, are you? I don't actually know what I'd have. I'll actually have to think about that, I've asked myself a question there. Quite like an old Landy, maybe a 90 or something, but uh, hmm, pick this up another time, I think. But uh, yeah, good spot, that. Uh, next up's from Ron Balondo. Loving the show, Dolly. Just want to ask, there's a lot of cheap components out in the market today, which is sometimes more than half the price of famous brands. Can you tell us a bit of your take when it comes to cheap mountain bike parts and components? Um, what do you recommend for budget bikers that want to get into sports but afraid to shell out huge bucks? Okay, so yeah, there's obviously loads of places you can save money on your mountain bike. Now, be sensible about this. Think about things that are safe, think about things that are gonna wear out, think about things that are gonna be logical, right? So we'll start with wheels. Now, if you wanna save money on a set of wheels, that's fine. You can get some good budget wheels. Just bear in mind that budget wheels in 27 and a half and budget wheels in 29 will be two different things. 29 inch budget wheels are gonna be heavier. They're just not gonna feel as good. So wheels is something we do say you should try and spend a bit more money on because ultimately you're pedaling that around, you're turning, you're rotating, revolving that weight. The lighter the weight is, the better your bike's gonna handle. And it's especially important with a bigger wheel, less so with 27 and a half. So yeah, you could get some budget 27 and a half, 27 and a half inch wheels and your bike will feel great. Just take care with the 29s. Also, some of the cheaper, bigger wheels can be a bit bandy and bendy, which is not what you want if you're running bigger wheels. Okay, so no name components like handlebars, stems, things like that. I'd have no issue with a stem. Not a lot can happen to a stem, they're pretty simple devices. Handlebars, I've no doubt that you can get some great no-name bars, but personally I would stick to a manufacturer that I know. Even if it's made in the same factory, I would stick to a manufacturer that I know that's got a warranty, it's got it's a reputable brand. Because let's face it, there are hundreds of brands out there and you can get some really good cheap stuff and you can get some stuff that will literally snap as you breathe on the stuff. So I would avoid that. And in fact, you've made me think that there's probably, there's probably a good video in there somewhere. There's places at AliExpress where you can buy stuff. Um, I am in the middle of buying some stuff and I have some stuff off camera that has arrived from there for a different video, but you've made me think about the fake carbon and the dangerous form of things. So use your common sense. With a heavy safety related item, handlebars is a good example, buy from a reputable brand. If you want to save money, don't go for something like carbon, get a set of alloy bars. Uh, again, you know, the material you choose will save you cash. Tires, to be honest, I'd stick to the major brands because even the major brands have cheap offerings. If you're going for a no-name brand, you really don't know the sort of quality you're gonna get. Despite the fact that tires are made in a handful of factories in Asia, uh, predominantly uh, continent will make the tires in Germany. But despite the fact they're all made somewhere, it doesn't mean they're gonna be as good as their next brand because those factories, as I know full well, I've seen on the inside of them, they have different areas for different brands. Yeah, some of those brands might not have an area that produces stuff in quite as good fashion as the high-end brands, for example. Um, where else? Transmissions, okay, so I would argue that Shimano Deal is hard to beat on price value, the way it works, it's outstanding, it really is. Okay, so the cassette is heavy, it's really heavy, but it's not the end of the day, but, uh, it's not the end of the world because of the fact you're gonna wear that out. I always tell, to tell people to not spend too much money on the transmissions because it's a consumable part. You are literally wearing your money away as you ride. Why would you do that if you're, you know, unless you're looking for something especially light or if you're looking for exceptional performance, Dior works phenomenally. Now, my bit of advice would be if you're going for a cheaper group set like that and you want it to feel like a better one, just get a better shifter and you get a bit more positivity from it. You could run an XT or even an XTR shifter and then have Dior everything else. In fact, I'd be happy with that setup to be honest, it works brilliantly. However, there are a few other brands out there. So there's Microshift, there's Box, there's Sunrace, Sunline. Um, there's loads of other brands producing great stuff on the market. Now, 
But where with some of those brands and including some of those that produce chains, they just won't have some of the features like Hyperglide Plus that you get on Shimano and some of the compatibility that you need to go with Eagle and X-Sync and things like that. So although it might work with 12 speed or 11 speed or whatever you're going for, you just won't have the optimized way of it working. So yes, you can save money on there, but to be honest, with how well drivetrains like uh, the Shimano deal, I can't see how you'd save that much money on it. So cranks perhaps, yeah, but stick with the chain the cassette, the derailleur and the shifter from one of the bigger brands, you won't regret it because they do work really well. Uh, chain rings though, chain rings is a good point. In fact, I've got a cheap chain ring on my new proof reactor. I've got a superstar chain ring. There was, I don't know, it was like 20 quid or something. So it's a real, it's a budget chain ring, but it looks beautiful. CNC machined, it's purple, and it's fully 12 speed compatible. Works a dream with the Shimano setup on there. But I've only got it on there at the moment because of the fact that you can't use the O chain system with a direct mount. If you want to know about that, look at my nuke proof reactor bike check video. Um, I will be doing something a bit down the line when I've moved it onto another bike. But uh, if you want to find out what it is, watch that video. Um, and dropper posts. Okay, so cheap dropper posts can be a bit heavy, but a good thing about most of the cheap dropper posts out there now, I hate to say it, they're probably more reliable than a lot of the other ones because they all use cartridges like, this one is a Brand X post that I'm in the middle of taking apart for another video. So that's the cartridge you get on the inside of budget seat posts. Now that was a Brand X seat post I've just taken apart. They're basically the same as the Shimano Pro one, the Koryak, the STG post, Giant Contact. Um, there's a number of them out there that use these cartridges on the inside. That's not a bad thing. Some people get obsessive. Oh, it has to be the RockShox fully hydraulic one or a semi-hydraulic one by Fox. Don't get me wrong, they're brilliant seat posts and you can uh, replace internal components on them. You can keep them going for many years. But these ones are great and the cartridges rarely go wrong. And if they do, you can replace the cartridge and keep your post going. And they're super simple to service as well. So there is a video coming up on that. Um, honestly, they're so good now. So cheap dropper posts. I'd have no problem buying a budget dropper post on my bike. Yeah, all right, they're a bit heavier, but the price you pay for something that works so well that costs you so little. Um, that's about it, really. Again, buying cheap stuff on your bikes, it's great. There's no problem doing that. Just take care of where you do it. Oh, another thing is suspension, might I add. Um, rear shocks, there seems to be less of an issue with a cheaper shock because they technically they do a little bit less on the bike, but with a cheaper fork, the damper unit stuff you get on the inside don't tend to be that good. So regardless of the structure of the fork, it's more about how the performance feels. So although there's loads of great budget brands out there, Manitou do some great cheap forks, so do Suntour, uh, X Fusion, but the bigger brands like RockShox, for example, I'll use in this case, on some of their forks, you could buy, say, a cheaper Revelation. And if you wanted to, at a later date, you could put a better damper from the top of the range Revelation in it and turn it into a better fork. The same with the air spring and some of the internal components. Now, this doesn't always work in brands, but I know on Fox and RockShox, you can do this on specific models. So that might be worth saving a little bit more for and getting the base model in a brand, like a bigger brand. And that way you can replace internal components later. Keep that fork going for longer if that interests you. Oh, sorry about that. That was uh, the man from DPD at the door dropping off some goodies. Okay, so next question then is from Marek Rohak. Hi Dolly, I've got a brand new DT Swiss XM 1700 set of wheels. Very nice. I mounted new GX 12 speaker set and I've assembled everything. But now when the bike is freewheeling or backpedaling, I hear a high pitched squeal over the 36 tooth ratchet sound. I check the hub, everything's greased and clean. Shifting works correctly. I even unmounted the rear brake, but the squeal high noise is still there. Any suggestions what it could be and how to get rid of that annoying sound? Uh, thank you, loving the show. To be honest, I don't know. The only time I've ever had noises from hubs as such, it's been the seals. So, I mean, this is a really old hub. It does need a bit of love actually on here, but the seals, little rubber seals there, if they're dry by any chance, they can just squeak or squeal a little bit. I've had that in the summer when I've been out riding in dry conditions and you're out for some time. You can get a bit of noise and stuff. You also get your pedals can squeak a bit when they go a bit dry with all the dust and stuff. Um, I would hope it's something like that. Failing that, I would double check you've mounted the cassette properly and there isn't any kind of additional spacer behind it. Um, but I can't think of any anything else it would be. 
they're good wheels, there's no reason that they should squeal. So try that, reverse engineer like, sort of what you've done a few times and hopefully you'll find it. Sorry, I can't be more specific with that one. Next question is from Marco Pachner. Hi, I've just ordered a new Ghost um, frame, uh, oh, FRAMR, and it's fitted with a SRAM GX Eagle drivetrain. The problem is, when the climbing gear is selected, the chain is far from straight. In fact, it's straight when the eighth gear, the fourth fastest, yeah, okay, is selected, which causes the typical problems such as noise and more resistance. I was wondering if this is normal and if the chain line is set properly. In which gear should the chain be straight and how do I change it? Thanks very much. Okay, so chain line is a bit of a problematic thing on suspension bikes, on basically on all mountain bikes. It totally matters with the width of your rear axle, the width of your bottom bracket shell, there's a whole number of things. Now, we've tried to make these things better by having boost on the front to space things out a bit better and by having a bigger rear end accordingly to move it all away in order then you can return your chain line without getting the chain ring close to things. But it does sound like your chain line could be off slightly. But do bear in mind though, like you so say, I'm assuming here, I might be wrong, that this was installed to your bike already when you got the bike. If you've put this on as a frame, then you might just not have that chain line right. So if you've not got it right, you want that chain ring as close as possible to the frame really. And now you can get a number of chain ring adapters. You get chain rings with spacers built into them. You can get chain, uh, chain ring spacers themselves to actually push it inboard. But there is like a limit of what you can do and how close you can actually get it. So you might need to go down in terms of chain ring size. Now, I've got a 34 tooth chain ring. I'll use my reactor as an example, and it's very close to the chain state on there. I couldn't go for any bigger, it's optimum, but it did come with a smaller chain ring, so you could change the chain line if you really needed to. Now, bear in mind, you've got 12 gears at the rear there. That's a lot for the chain to do, and yes, your chain should technically be running smoothly, but it's not uncommon to have a bike that has, say, the top four gears making a bit more noise than the rest of them, where it'll be nice and smooth. Now, unfortunately, on some bikes, it's just a thing where you can't actually get a perfect chain line because of the design of the bike with that many gears on there, and it is a thing. In fact, Calvin Jones made a video over on Park Tool about chain line, looking at a few options of the bike. I think one was a fat bike, so obviously you're very limited on what you can do with that, and basically explaining that sometimes it's okay. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And Calvin fixes everything. That guy is a proper guru of bike mechanics. So. Unfortunately, you do notice a bit more noise. And in fact, I actually forget which, which it is. One of my bikes currently is a little noisy in those top two lowest gears. But the thing is, you ride them for such a short amount of time compared to the rest of your transmission, it's not that much of a problem. But there is one major adjustment on your rear derailleur that can affect things here. And that is your B screw or the B tension. So that adjusts the height of the, of the jockey wheels or the upper one in particular. Uh, also known as a guide wheel, in relation to the sprockets on the cassette. Now, this is crucial on 12 speed especially, far less so on 11 and 10 and others. But on 12, if you don't get this perfect, you will just will not have clean shifting gear. So there is a chance that this adjustment could actually clean things up on there. Now, if it is wrongly adjusted, you can still get all your gears but your derailleur will be making a lot more noise, whether it's either pushed to the limit a bit more or if the wheel is actually too close to the cassette. So have a look at that, and I reckon that you might be able to fix it by getting this sorted. Now, there's a few things on the market available to you, so SRAM actually make, I don't know if I've got one here to show you. I used one at work recently, I don't know if I keep one at home in my selection. They make a little spacer, yes, like, that's an 11 speed one, but they do they do one for Eagle, and basically enables you to sort of rest the chain, uh, the rear sprockets in this gap, and you use this as a guide to set the distance there. It's a really good bit of kit. Now, if your bike didn't come with one, so you can get one online. Make sure it's an Eagle one for your 12 speed though, and it makes setting it up so much easier. It's a good little bit of kit that. So uh, hopefully that will set you on your way. All right, next question from Finn Williams. Hey Finn. Does having a steeper seat tube angle have any drawbacks when going downhills? Downhill bikes still have really slack seat tube angles. Do bikes descend better with slacker seat tube angles? Uh, okay, so descending has nothing to do with a seat tube angle really. It's all about climbing, or basically it's all about the seated position on the bike. 
downhill bikes are designed in a way to enable them to have the angles they need with the amount of suspension travel they need to clear the frame. Basically, that's the most important thing. And then I'll make them long enough to suit the style of rider that goes on them. And then they'll have adjustability like the chain stays, for example, to grow or shrink the back end of that bike accordingly. You don't have to pedal them uphill though. So they're basically designed just to be as fast as possible in a very limited way of riding. Whereas any other type of bike, you've got to pedal the thing up the hill. If you're running a slack seat angle, it's not much fun. You run a steep seat angle, it's amazing for climbing on a bigger bike like that. But the problem with that, you can't just put a steep seat angle and the front end has to grow proportionally to enable you to do that. And actually, you're finding now that modern enduro bikes are longer than downhill bikes. Um, sometimes in the wheelbase, sometimes it just in the front end, but generally they're getting longer. Bearing in mind, they've got to be efficient for all terrain, up, down, along, over, everything in the middle. Downhill bikes, they've only got to go down. So they're designed to be as fast as possible in that way. And they simply need all the clearance they can for that massive wheel travel. Uh, so that's why you tend to see them with strange frame designs, subframes, slack seat angles, things like that. So it won't affect downhill performance, only uphill performance. Next up is from Life of Make. How much difference does a dirty drivetrain actually make? Can you do a video about that maybe with actual measurements like weights on pedals uh, as a DIY check? Not sure what that means. Uh, dirty chain cassette, jockey wheels, chain ring. Would really appreciate something like that in spring to try myself. Um, do you mean in terms of power? Um, you know, how much power you might lose through a dirty drivetrain and a clean one? Or do you mean through how much it might wear out? There's a few things at hand here. Now, I know that Muckoff have a chain testing facility and they, they test the friction of drivetrains. Basically, they test different chains on different sprockets in different conditions with different lubricants. When I say conditions, they put mud or clay or sand, grit, etc., on there or run them completely dry, um, sometimes with you know dust and things in there. And they'll run them with a certain amount of torque going through them and they'll measure the output, basically. Uh, it's a really cool system. We can't get down there at the moment because of this flipping pandemic. So um, I do plan on going down there and researching that because you can simulate a whole bunch of things in a lamp test, which is quite cool. But actually, I think there's probably another video at hand there, just thinking about it. Wouldn't it be cool to have um, two bikes with basically identical drivetrains on them that are both brand new and you're ridden them, you ride them the exact same amount uh, through an entire winter and you maintain one of them as you should do and the other one you do nothing on. It's a bit late for doing that now this time of year, but I could, probably don't want to hear this, I might do this for next winter. So I could start winter with, you know, maybe say in October and go through October to April with zero maintenance on one bike. I think that'd be a really good experiment to see what happened actually. And the other bike, just treat it like I would treat all my bikes. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea, I think. Wonder if I could find someone who could do it in a faster way. Some lunatic that could ride every single day for two weeks an insane amount of miles. Maybe that's a way to do it. I'll, um, I'll sit on that and think about it, but um, some good questions in there this week, actually. Keep them coming, and we'll catch you next week. See you later.